And so this random guy showed up at our office one day with a CD full of documents, and he claimed that this is proof that they are doing it. So how do you know if that's real or not? Well, you need someone who knows how networks work and what fiber optic cables are, and that's where Tech Team comes in. So I got that call that day. It was pretty exciting. So that's, that's our normal job, but now we're doing even more, is my point. So now we are, in addition to still doing all of that stuff, um, you know, case support for EFS legal cases, now we're doing open source development projects um, focusing on the, the issues we care about. Like I say, the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, making sure that you can speak freely, have confidentiality, have anonymity, have security, um, be secure in your papers in person, like the Fourth Amendment promises. So we're writing software to help achieve those goals, in addition to our legal work, to helping to achieve those goals. So we got started gently. Um, well, like I say, when I was there before, from 2003 to 2006, we funded the development of the Tor project for a year. Um, everyone's heard of Tor, I hope. Some? Yeah, good. Everyone check it out. It's torproject.org. So Roger and Nick, the developers, they had just graduated from MIT, and they were trying to avoid getting a real job, and they wanted to stay working on Tor forever because it's so fun. So um, one of our lawyers tasked me with the job of finding what's, that, what's a good anonymity system. I know there's a bunch. There's Freenode, and there's, or Freenet, and there's this Tor thing, and there's another one, and there's another one, and there's another one. And there's the whole bunch, so I had to research them all and find out which one's the best. And I thought that Tor looked the best. Um, and they agreed, so we decided, well, we'll pay their salaries for a year, and, and then we'll you know, make demands of them. We'll say, hey, Roger and Nick, I know you hate Windows, but if you want to have a good anonymity system, you have to support Windows. So then it became a requirement, support Windows. Another requirement is grow the size of the Tor network by, I don't know, a factor of 10 this year or whatever. And so it was my job to make sure that they met those goals, sort of like technical liaison friend. So basically all you have to do with those guys, they're so good, you just have to like look at them and then you notice that they're totally working super hard and then you say, cool. So that was pretty nice. Yeah, they're super geniuses. It's some of the best software I've seen. Um, so it was cool because we got Tor off the ground and now they're their own organization. They have their own, they're their own 401c3, uh, 501c3. Um, they have their own thing, they have their own money and it's totally awesome and they're even hiring. So that was a success and we thought that was cool. How can we do more of that? So in my absence between 2006 and 2010, um, the tech team started doing more of that kind of thing. I went off back into industry doing engineering again, and the tech team started doing all sorts of cool stuff. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we've been up to as a way of hoping to convince you that what I say that we're going to be doing this year, you'll believe me. And we've already started, of course, and you can download some code, so it's totally real. So first off, we had this fun idea, uh, PCAP diff. We wanted to detect violations of network neutrality. Sometimes your ISP will mangle your traffic or um, falsely shut it down in the middle. Like, for example, Comcast was doing this. Um, I'm happy to say that they changed their behavior for the best for everyone, for, for them and for all their subscribers. But for a while there, they were, um, if you would use BitTorrent, they would actually insert false TCP reset packets that your peer never sent but they would tell you that your peer did. They would spoof the IP addresses and everything. And then your BitTorrent client would say, oh, I lost my connection, bummer, I can't download that movie. And then you try again, and then they might do it again, and they might not. And so effectively, you get a much slower Bit BitTorrent experience. Um, and they, they say they're doing this to like cope with network congestion. Um, and I actually ended up believing them when they said that because the solution they eventually implemented really was a true solution to the network congestion problem. Um, but you know, it, the, it underscored the point that any ISP can be doing any of this stuff at any time. And when you send a message to a website or to a BitTorrent peer or to IRC, you don't necessarily know if it got there as you intended it. So what we want to do is detect any kind of mangling going on. So PCAP diff is just what it sounds like. You and your friend 
both turn on Wireshark and you get packet traces and then you diff them and see if what they got is what you sent and what you got is what they sent. And so then we, we had this thing, PCAP diff is one component of a bigger system called Switzerland because it's neutral and it detects violations of network neutrality. Unfortunately, it's pretty geeky and hard to use. We never got it to the point where like random people can just turn it on and have it say yes or no. It's very much a, you know, turn on Wireshark, write the right, you know, expression rule to capture only the relevant traffic. It's a very nerdy thing, unfortunately. So um, it still it did its job, though. And Google has a similar thing. Um, one of our friends who used to work at EFF, Derek Slater, is now a policy guru at Google. And he spearheaded the development of a similar thing at Google. Very cool. So a couple of people are in, doing the same basic idea. And that is, let's actually check if the network is neutral. You know, only way to know for sure is to look. So that was one thing, and you can download that. It's open source, it's Python. We had a bunch of help from cool volunteer friends. I always like to name everybody because, although, you know, Peter Eckersley, EFF staff technologist, he, you know, it was his idea and he wrote much of the code, but he didn't do it all by himself. And random people in the world with a cool idea or a cool patch are totally encouraged to pitch in. So it's their first tier open source project is my point. So that was fun. Um, all my slides I don't give URLs because you'll never remember the exact text of a URL. But luckily we have enough Google juice that I can just do this. And the top hit, the top hit is the right thing. So just, just remember these keywords. So if you care about Switzerland, look up EFF Switzerland and then you'll, you'll get there. EFF Switzerland. <laughs> it's a fine country. So this one is super exciting, the SSL Observatory. And this is one that started last year and we're doing much more on it this year because it's been incredibly fruitful and hilarious, which for me is a key goal. Um, if it's not funny, I'm not really convinced that we should be doing it. And so the Observatory is definitely a good project on that basis. So um, this is another project that began I was, you know, even when I wasn't working at EFF, I was sort of hanging around and, you know, we're all friends and I would sort of, we'd always be throwing ideas around. So my, fr my co-worker, uh, Jesse Burns, from my security consulting company that I worked at after EFF, and then Peter Eckersley and Seth Schoen, EFF staff technologists, they cooked up this scheme to talk to every web server in the world and then on the port 443 for SSL and grab their SSL handshake traffic, you know, with another packet trace, save it, and then extract the SSL certificates from the handshake and then mangle them and put them in a giant database. And then we can query the database for amusing facts about SSL as deployed in the world. Um, the goal being, well, there's a bunch of goals. One. We obviously we think that SSL is super important because without it you have no security guarantees whatsoever on your web app. You know, network neutrality is the least of your concerns. Um, there's all sorts of spying. There's traffic mangling. There's authentication problems. You've all heard of Fire Sheep, I'm sure. All those things that are trouble. SSL is the partial solution to them. So we want to know as much as we can about how SSL actually works for real people in the real world. So again, how do you know? You just check. A lot of these questions are just empirical and we're sort of taking a scientific view to them. So we just grab a bunch of data and then start gnawing on it. So the results of the observatory are hilarious. Um, in particular, for example, of all of the hilarious, I, I would say hilarious both in quotes and without quotes. Which, to me, that's like double hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so for example, you have like, I think it was roughly 14 million hosts even answered us at all out of the entire IPv4 space. So that tells you the people who are even listening on 443 is actually pretty small. And then of those, only 11 million actually said SSL to us when we talked to them. Like a lot of times if you connect to a server on 443, they're actually talking SMTP or HTTP or some proprietary weird thing. Um, 
because you know you can, so some people just do. So you have 11 million actual HTTPS servers, and then of those, how many of them are actually serving real CA signed certificates? Does anyone have any guesses? What's a fun guess? Is it half? Is it all? 1%? 20%? Anyone else? I'd say no more than 10. No more than 10? Percent or million? Percent, okay. All right, anyone else? Well, you're, you're on the right track. Very low, right? I think it's uh, 1.4 million, something like that, out of the 11 million who are even listening at all. So that means a lot of them are self-signed. Uh, the rest of them are self-signed certificates or um, signed by a CA that Firefox or Internet Explorer have never heard of, which is close enough. So the, I think an interesting lesson from that is that people find the SSH model of deployment a lot easier than the CA model of deployment. For example, you know, everyone has SSH. No one really is using Telnet anymore. But the vast majority of people are still using HTTP, which is the Telnet of web apps. And of the people who are using HTTPS, the vast majority would rather deploy in an SSH way than in the official cool way. Now, the next interesting thing, though, is that Question? Yeah, well, I had a comment. Uh, the reason, uh, one of the rationales for that is a lot of small businesses uh, that need to get a website up quickly and need, uh, you know, some kind of security. Uh, you know, either can't afford or don't have the time to go through the whole process of getting the CA signed certificate. Uh, yeah. And will do self signed. Uh, it makes perfectly good sense from a lot of business type perspectives. Of course. I agree completely. Um, my own, so the, I don't know if everyone could hear, the, the basic idea is it's just more economical to go self signed. And it's kind of a pain in the ass to do the CA thing. And you have to pay anywhere from $5 to 10000 And you have to do all this rigmarole. And yet everyone in the world has SSH and it just works, right? So we need to make. Um, SSL deployment more economical and at the same time more secure because as the observatory will show there's tons and tons of hilarious security mistakes in the database. For example, you have CAs and certificates that like for example a certificate says hi there world I've got a public private key pair and it's uh, 512 bits. Well. That's very weak. Um, 1024 is getting, people, people argue about whether a 1024 bit key is safe. Um, it's kind of like the bare minimum and it's for extended validation certificates, it's now obsolete. Which of course, by the way, we also found extended validation certificates with 1024 bit keys. An outright violation of the EV specification. Another hilarious one was we found a, I think it was a 511 bit key. <laughs> now, you know, you can have as many bits in your key as you want. Um, you know, you could put seven or 1,234, it could be anything. But a strange number like 511 uh, is amusing because in the way RSA works, you always want to have the high order bit be one so that you get the full bit strength of your string. Basically, if you have leading zeros, it's like not even having any. Because you can say, I have a, a two million bit key, and the, all the bits except for the low order 511 are zero. Well, that's equivalent to a 511 bit key. So basically, the point being, you've got this malformed key. It's essentially, someone made a mistake when generating their RSA key. And how, I don't know, because OpenSSL won't generate such a key. Somebody somewhere, did it by themselves with a shell script or something. I don't even know. But a CA was happy to sign that. Now, that's another fun thing, is that CAs are happy to sign anything. Crazy stuff. What do you think the most commonly signed name on the internet is? Like, what, what's the name that's in most certs? Wellsfargo.com, Google.com, any guesses? Bob. Bob, <laughs> a, a fine guess, as it turns out. <laughs> Localhost, you win. The most commonly signed name is localhost. Why would a CA sign localhost? I'll tell you, they're not checking. If you give them like a string of random bits, like if you just give them a certificate signing request that's all zeros, I bet you one of them would just sign it. They're, all, they're signing localhost. Now, I found a fun thing. 
Localhost is the single most commonly signed name, but there's this general problem of CAs, public CAs. You know, these CAs operate for the whole internet, but they're happy to sign names that are not valid on the internet, like unqualified names, like just mail. And on, on your local network, that expands to mail.yourcompany.com, if you have your DNS set up that way, or your DHCP. But it has no meaning on the internet at large. So why is an internet CA signing this private name? Because they're not checking. So I did a fun thing. My coworker at my previous job was saying, you know how funny it is that we can get names, the name mail signed. Because that means we can go on anyone's internal network and perform a perfect man in the middle attack. And we only have to buy the one cert and it'll work on everyone's private network. So because you know, you'll go to, like you just type in mail in your browser, you go to a host named Mail, it's run by us, and yet we present to you a perfectly good CA signed certificate. It's, from, it's really from VeriSign, it's, it's a correct, true certificate, and everything. So VeriSign, or whoever, had no business signing that certificate, but they do, and so now attackers can use that to attack anyone. And so, what's a super important resource on your internal network, I thought to myself? How about exchange, or just EXCH, which is a common naming pattern people use for exchange servers? You have like exchange01.example.com, or exch-internal.example.net, or whatever like that. So I scanned the observatory, and I found that actually, as popular as localhost is, the exchange-related name pattern, unqualified exchange-related names, are even more popular. I think I got a total of uh, 5,000. The local hosts come up to um, 2,800, I think, in, in the whole universe. And then the, the exchange ones were like 5,000 or something. And of course, again, out of the um, valid 1.4 million names, 37,000 of them are just unqualified in general. So there's tons of names that you're probably using on your internal network that are totally man in the middle middleable with real certificates completely real, signed by real CAs that your browsers really trust. So the trouble is, CAs are not quite living up to their promises, and we have this economic problem where people would rather just do self-signed anyway, after all it works for SSH. So anyway, I've said too much about the observatory. Do Google for observatory, and again, there's source code, and you can download the entire data set and play with it yourself. There's many more findings to be made. Like we, if you, if you Google this, our page, we have presentations we've given at DEF CON and CCC in Germany. And you can see some results that we have. But you can, we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. So you could discover brand new results that would be new to us. So you can either download our giant database, or you can download our code and run your own observatory. Or you can um, install a working copy of our database on an Amazon EC2 instance. We have a how-to, and we, we publish an Amazon storage volume that you can just attach to your EC2 virtual machine. And then you'll have our database, and that way you don't have to do the, the lengthy, painful setup and download the giant five gigabyte file or whatever it is. Um, so you can start playing with it right away, is my point. And please do. You will find funny stuff. Other people have. It's been a good time. And so there's plenty of original research to be done. And also you can patch our horrible code. The code is very much like research quality. Um, <laughs> like we, at three in the morning on a Sunday is when a lot of it was written, you know. So if you can find a way to make it faster or better, feel free. That's what I call hack and slash. Hack and slash, that's what we did. So a related story, oh, question. As you finish, is there any way to do this project that's a tricky question. And there's another tricky question is server name, SNI, whatever that stands for. Um, so what we were doing was talking to IP addresses, IPv4 addresses, and then just saving whatever we get. Obviously, the IPv6 space is too huge to just exhaustively search, <laughs> right? So we're trying to figure out some ways of coping with that problem, because obviously, it's going to come up and bite us soon. Any day now, we're going to be migrating to IPv6. And we'll need to have an observatory for that too. But we just, we haven't gotten there yet. However, um, a couple slides from now, you'll see a way of avoiding that problem and solving it in a better way. And it relates to this one. And then after that, there's more. So, okay, so HTTPS everywhere. Has anyone heard of it? I hope someone has, a couple. It's a Firefox plugin that we made that makes Firefox 
it translates, it transforms HTTP URLs into HTTPS URLs. And that's not as simple as it sounds, unfortunately, but we try. So there's all these sites like Twitter or Wikipedia or New York Times. They have port 443, 443 turned on, but they don't like, it's not a first tier, it's not thought of as loved inside the organization and they have it on sometimes by accident, you know. Um, like New York Times, so, some URLs just don't even work on 443. Some do. Some work if you transform them according to a regular expression. Some don't. Wikipedia is that way. Um, so what we do is this Firefox plugin will, it, when you load your page, it crawls the DOM and says, oh, look, a URL that I have a, a matching regular expression for. Transform, transform, transform. And it turns it into an HTTPS link. So then you can sort of trick websites into serving HTTPS for you, even if they don't by design. Um, and it works better for some sites than for others, obviously. And for the ones that it doesn't work for, that people want it to work for, we, you know, we call up the operators of those websites and we nag them, and sometimes we get results. So it'll do things like, um, oh, it does in addition to, yeah, yeah, good, I have this here. Uh, yeah, uh, doesn't Google Chrome have that built into it? Though? Google Chrome has a similar feature that's not quite as good, but we're talking to them about how to make it better. And we had lunch with their security guy last week. And they really want to have something much like this. And they're working on it. The trouble is Chrome's extension mechanism doesn't let us do all the nasty magic that we do, that Firefox lets you do. And so they're trying to like build it in a little bit. They have a preceded, this site works with SSL list that it'll use when it can, stuff like that. Yeah, I, I switched to Chrome when I went signed to Linux 6. So that's, I still use Firefox. So. Mostly when I can't remember what my passwords were. Right. Chrome is a fine thing. So one of the important things, does everybody know what the secure flag on cookies is? Raise your hand if you know what that is. I got, oh, a couple. Yes. So another one. Here's the problem, is that even web developers tend not to know about it. So you have this thing. Say, say you're serving your web app on HTTPS, and people log in, and then you give them a login cookie. But unless you say, you know, in the, in the header, set cookie, colon, login session equals big long string of numbers, semicolon, expires on this date, you're also supposed to say, semicolon, secure. That means, dear browser, please only ever send this cookie back to me over HTTPS. Don't send it over HTTP. The trouble is, Without that flag, the browser will try to send it over HTTP if it's ever asked. And that gives attackers like the Fire Sheep attack and, and related attacks a chance to steal your cookie, even on sites that, in, pr in principle at least, work with HTTPS. So our plugin also just, regardless of whatever the server said, it just does treat cookies as secure, things like that. So we're trying to cope with sort of gaps in web apps and gaps in the browser. And so this is another one where it's open source, of course, and community participation has been big. So a lot of it revolves around writing those regular expression rules to make, okay, here's how Washington Post transforms its URLs for security. Here's how New York Times does. Here's how Wikipedia does. Here's how Twitter does, whatever. Um, and they're all just a little bit different. Someone has to write those rules, and obviously we can't write them all. So people just submit patches all the time and give us new rules and we roll them in. And in the, in the development branch, it says 499, but it's, it's, it's over 500 now and more every day. So please do join in if you think it's cool. Let's see, what else? Okay, so we, that's a really big, for us, a big deal. It's got about half a million regular users who like, for example, we can tell because they ping our site for an update every week or whatever it is. And we get about half a million new pings every week, and it's been growing, growing, growing. So these are regular active users, so people really like it. So a lot of times you'll hear security people say, oh, you know, users don't care about security. Oh, you know, people are ignorant and we can't help them. Well, that's not true. Half a million people sought out this security solution, and they're getting it, and they, they like it, and they keep using it. No, but it's half a million. Yeah. So, you know, it's definitely more than zero. And it's several orders of magnitude more than zero. <laughs> so, amusingly, HTTPS Everywhere is the top way that people get to EFF.org from search engines. So, like, lots of people care about 
the Humble Indie Bundle, which was a cool thing. Lots of people care about the Patriot Act. You know, one in 20 people who come to our site came to us just by searching just for Patriot Act. But that's nothing compared to the people who get to us for HTTPS Everywhere, which we think is cool. To us, that indicates that this new expanded mission of doing more tech projects is going to, you know, people care about it because even just one of them, our simplest one, has been a huge draw of traffic. So we're excited. So again, if you just Google for HTTPS Everywhere, you'll get to us, obviously. So another fun thing that Peter made last year is called Panopticlick. So you may know that obviously cookies allow websites to track you. Um, sometimes that's the goal. Um, sometimes it's just for authentication. But of course, um, developers know that there's many more ways besides just plain old cookies that you can actually identify a browser uniquely. But it's hard to explain that to normal people who don't like write PHP code all day. Um, you know, normal people don't know how technically the web works, so we have to find some way to explain it because a, most of EFF's constituency is like people who love computers and love free speech and love privacy, but they're not necessarily hackers. So we have to explain to them what's going on. So Panopticlick, that's what Panopticlick is about, is to demonstrate how unique your browser is globally, even without any cookies. And the answer is extremely unique. Now, as you can imagine, you only need 33 bits of entropy to uniquely identify everyone in the world. Uh, because, of course, 33 is 8 billion, and there's less than 8 billion people in the world. So, um, so as long as you can get somewhere near that in any kind of information from the browser's profile, you can actually get really close to uniquely identifying browsers. And, in fact, uh, I think we went way beyond what we need. So Peter Eckersley and Tim Jones developed this thing inspired by code from BrowserSpy and my former colleague Kate McKinley who wrote a fun thing called Breadcrumbs which shows exactly well, like when you say in Firefox or Chrome delete my all my all my cached stuff all my cookies everything not all of it is deleted and breadcrumbs exposed a couple bugs in a bunch of browsers. Safari, I think, was the worst offender. Safari on Windows behaved quite differently than Safari on Mac. It was funny. Anyway, you can download her stuff, too. So, for example, what we found is just by measuring these things, we get lots of bits of entropy. So the user agent string is very long and contains lots of stuff. And it contains enough information to give us almost 15 bits of entropy, meaning that there's two to the 15 different user agent strings that we observed, which is a lot. Uh, HTTP accept headers like I accept gzip, I accept deflate, I accept JPEGs and pings and not flash or whatever. Again, that's 13 and a half bits of entropy, two to the 13.5 different possible HTTP accept headers. Um, and so the server gets to see what those are. Similarly, your browser plugin details, I thought that was surprisingly low at 5.66 bits. Um, the time zone you're in, um, screen size and color depth, fonts, are cookies even turned on, and so on. So if you add all that up, you can actually uniquely identify web browsers in the world without any cookies. You just have a little bit of JavaScript that says, okay, what are the headers? What's the user agent? How big is the screen? What's the color depth? Uh, what, what time zone are they in and what's their fonts? And then you pretty much know who they are. No cookies. Yeah, it's a fingerprint. So again, you can try this out yourself. It's open source. You can submit your own browser profile to our database, although it probably won't be much new compared to us. I mean, it won't be huge news to us because we've already got so many that we know what we need to know, but it's fun. You can check it out, and it'll tell you how unique is your browser, and it'll say, congratulations, you have the same profile as three other people in the whole world, and then you can know exactly how non-unique or how non-anonymous your browser is. So again, you can, another Google query that you can get a kick out of is Peter explains all this entropy stuff in a cool blog post that's tied to this issue. So there's a Google search you can look for to um, read that. It's a very cool blog post. Okay, so that's what we did in 2010 alone. So what's up for 2011? So one thing, the key thing to answer the IPv6 question is more SSL observing. We know there's much more work to be done there. For one thing, there's many more ports besides 443 that might be TLS endpoints. 
For another thing, there's that IPv6 problem. For another thing, there's that SNI problem, um, which are hard to solve in a brute force way. So what we've done in the development branch of HTTPS Everywhere is we've added a new little bit that's totally optional and you can turn it on or off. And that is to, whenever your browser sees a new certificate from a new server, it pings our server. We have a little database server set up with a little REST interface. And it says, hey there, have you seen this certificate yet? And then if our server says no, your browser will send us the cert that it observed. And then we have a new entry in our observatory. So that way, um, we can find the IPv6 endpoints without having to brute force them. We can find the certificates that you get with SNI versus with regular old TLS um, and things like that. The other goal is that we cannot solve in the old way of doing the observatory, which I call statically, you know, by pure brute force running a thing in a data center that just crawls the internet is we would like to someday detect man-in-the-middle attacks with the observatory. So, for example, it's going to be the case that our observatory sees a certain set of certificates in the world. But if you're in a certain place, like the hotel that I'm staying at, for example, I'll get you a Wireshark of this. It's bizarre. They man in the middle all SSL. I don't know why. Um, but we would never have observed that from our data center, you know, or from Jesse's house. So, but if you have the plugin, you will observe it because, of course, you're there and you'll see it. So what we want to do is we want to identify a man-in-the-middle attacks. We'll say, like, oh, a um, hundred people tried to visit Gmail and 99 of them got the same old boring cert and one of them got some weird cert. Isn't that strange? And then it'll show up in our database. And then we can say, well, something bad happened that time. Isn't that odd? It's kind of like, has anyone heard of Perspectives? It's a cool, also a cool Firefox plugin, not made by us. It's by, I think they're from MIT, um, some students at MIT. And now, if you go to networknotary.org, you'll get to their thing. It's a similar kind of idea where instead of, or I should say, in addition to the CA way of identifying a site, you also sort of hope to get consensus from notaries or other observers in the world. You can say, Dear networknotary.org, I got this cert when I tried to go to Gmail. Is that, what other, is that what you guys see? And then they say, yes, we've seen that same cert for the last 100 days. And then you know that it's probably the real Gmail. Google itself provided such a service. They announced it yesterday in a blog post by Ben Laurie, uh, which I hope you'll read because it's very cool. They do a thing very similar to Perspectives, but with DNS. And you, what you do is you do a DNS lookup for hash of the certificate dot google pki test dot com or whatever and then they give you an answer back in a txt record that says oh yes we first observed that cert on this day and we've seen it for 140 days or whatever or zero or what the hell are you talking about no such entry things like that it's very cool so we hope that um, these efforts can combine to provide authentication for web servers that is more robust than just the CA system alone. Because as we've seen, so many people don't even bother with the CA system. And why shouldn't everyone have security? Even if you don't have the organizational resources or the money or the time or the know-how, SSH works automatically, shouldn't HTTPS too? So obviously we need to have some new mechanism to cope with the, the problem of PKI. Especially as, as the observatory shows, CAs are not doing a very good job right now. So, but that's, that's just one of our many projects. We have another one called Do Not Track. Okay, question? Uh, yeah, uh, related and uh, Consider doing a, uh, like a fingerprint uh, randomizer or something like that as a plugin for Firefox? Um, it would be hard. You would have to lie to JavaScript, which would cause a lot of things to break. Um, for example, you know, Gmail needs to know how big your screen is so that it can draw a DOM with your email in it. And if you tell it a lie, like, oh, my screen is one pixel by 10,000, you're going to get one pixel by 10,000 of email. Yeah. So the trouble is, there's so many things that you can't, it would pretty much break everything, unfortunately. So this is a real head scratcher. So keep scratching your heads and see if you can think a way around that. I don't know how, without changing APIs. It's going to be ugly. 
question. Maybe send it a bunch of bogus data to confuse it. I suppose, but then how do you make sure that your bogus data doesn't identify you even more uniquely? <laughs> hmm. That's why I say you need the random one. Yeah, well, hmm, this is the Every first exact bogus data that I've seen. It's a, it's a total conundrum, it's, and therefore very fun. So, another question. No, a quick comment. Uh, disable JavaScript, use no script. Yeah. And that's what I do. Uh -huh. no. uh, just enable certain trusted sites. Obviously, Google.com is one of those sites you're going to have to enable. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Script is the way to go. Obviously, no script is a great thing. I use that too. Yeah, it's good. So, who's heard of Do Not Track? couple people. Yeah, it's this new weird thing. Technically, it's almost nothing, and that's kind of the beauty of it. All it is is your browser sends a header. I think it's it used to be x-do-not-track and now it's dnt or something. And you just say 1 or 0. And what that's it, we're still arguing about what that's going to mean to servers. But the idea is you would say something like dear server, please don't give me advertising or track me beyond what you'd need to, like don't track me beyond what it would take, for example, to be authenticated to Gmail. And don't give me behaviorally tracked, behaviorally tracked ads. For example, some sites will give you ads that, because they know that you used to look, like last week you were looking at pants, and this week you're looking at shirts, they know that you're probably going to care about belts next, right? As opposed to a thing like Gmail, <coughs> which um, does a lot of its work just by content. When I'm, excuse me, when I'm reading my Gmail, obviously it's my dumping ground for all my cryptography mailing lists. So all of my ads are like, buy RSA tokens, buy our new funny hardware module, you know, so on. And it's all ads that are related to the mail that I'm really reading. <coughs> excuse me. So Gmail, for example, it gives you these very detailed ads and it knows a lot about you, but it's not necessarily from behavior tracking. But a lot of privacy advocates, they're worried about the behavior tracking. Uh, you create these giant server-side databases of where everyone goes. And of course, this works across sites, too. You know, um, For example, a, a thing like a double click or a quantcast, it knows you often through panopticlick-like means, regardless of cookies. It knows you from all the sites you've been to. It knows you from Amazon, and it knows that this is the same you when you're visiting you know, Gmail. And it knows it's the same you when you visit um, whatever, uh, online petfoodstore.net. You know, it knows it's you, and it knows you across everywhere. And it's very unclear what the legal protection of that data is. Um, we think that a lot of it is going to be subject to very low bar subpoenas and uh, governmental orders that don't meet like the, the, the full Fourth Amendment judicially approved warrant standard, for example. Um, and basically, you know, you as a user have no relationship with this company. Did you ever sign up with DoubleClick? No. Do you even know who Quantcast is? No. Have you heard of Axiom or... Um, What's, and there's another one. There's a Blue Cava. There's a, oh, Rap Leaf. They're my favorite. Look for Rap Leaf. R A P L E A F. They're great. You have no relationship with them that you know about, but they know about it. And they know about everywhere you've been. So the idea is not to destroy internet advertising. Um, all those content based ad systems would, we think, like I say, we're still arguing about what's going to happen, would still be. Um, supported even if do not track equals one. But that cross-site behavioral tracking is what we hope to enable people to opt out of with this header. So Mozilla already supports the header. Um, Google's thinking about it. Uh, I think Opera supports it. I, uh, Microsoft has their own version of it that they invented a couple years ago, actually. They wanted to be ahead of the game. But of course, their own marketing department said no. But now they're saying yes. Um, the mark the Advertising um, world is actually turning around on this. They want to be seen as good actors, and that involves allowing people to opt out. And you know, we all know that only a tiny percentage of people who actually know about and care will opt out. So, like, it's not really. We don't think it's going to hurt business models that much, but it will give people who care the power they want to declare what their preferences are. So we're hoping to make it a win-win for everybody. But it's still very, like this advertising agency, 
world, that whole market, they turned around only recently. And Mozilla and Microsoft implemented this thing only recently. Um, so it's all very brand new, and there's a WC3 standards meeting about it in Princeton, which unfortunately I was supposed to go, but I can't make it. But point being, everyone's going to be talking about how to make this thing happen, including EFF. And so it's been kind of exciting. It's a strange thing, but it's right up there with our, our mission of you know, giving users the power to have the civil liberties that they want on the internet. So this one is less technical and more social. Like, you know, standards process is always political. Um, but it's key work, and we're going to be there. So another thing we're doing is, again, much more social or political than technical. And that is kind of like I mentioned before with HTTPS Everywhere. We're trying to make it so that sites support HTTPS on purpose instead of just by accident, or at least at all. Because as we've seen, a tiny minority of them actually do support it. So what we do is we contact sites like New York Times, Washington Post, Wikipedia, and we beg and plead with them, please, please turn on HTTPS. Please, please turn it on in the correct way. Please, please help us make our plugin work with your site. Our users will be so happy. Did you know we have half a million users? It's not just a handful of weirdos. It's half a million people, and it's growing really fast. And so they say, well, I heard that HTTPS was really slow. Or, well, I don't really have the $5 to buy a certificate from a CA. You hear that. Exactly. They have that, but they don't have the $5. Yeah, stuff like that. So we try to convince them through both technical and social means, like, hey, yes, you're right. When you turn it on, it was slow on your site. Because there's other misconfigurations on your site, which if you fixed, you'd get better performance all the way around with security and without security. And then they say, wow, I didn't know that. And then they turn it on. So um, I'm, for my experiences doing that, I'm writing up um, a big giant white paper on how to achieve high performance um, with SSL. And of course, you know, it turns out that SSL or TLS is really the lowest of all, your, of all your performance hits. But you have to make sure that it is first. And it turns out that once you check, there's all these in, inefficiencies that you're suffering from now, but they are indeed exacerbated when you turn on TLS. So how do you fix it? So I got all this technical mumbo jumbo. That white paper is supposed to have come out months ago. Um, for sure, real soon now, like next week. Really, it's almost done. Um, I just need to get the thumbs up from some grown-ups and from one of the sites that I use as an example. Oh, I'm saying five minutes. Very good. So I will maybe skip some stuff. I will not skip this. This is my most favorite thing. It's my, one of my two most favorite things. The open source security auditing project is the thing that I'm spearheading. We've started it. We had some results. The goal, so that, you know, your Microsofts and your Googles and your Ebays and your, you know, all the, the PayPals and the big companies, they have the ability and the money to hire um, security experts to help them fix their stuff. Find the bugs, fix the bugs, break in, steal all the money, and then tell them how they did it. That's what I used to do before, between stints at EFF and Google. Um, and it was very fun. And you know, Microsoft can pay us $350 an hour, or whatever it is. But open source projects don't have that money. So what we want to do is basically do the same work for free as an, as an EFF thing. So um, we want to, because we're going to have this panel later on today where I'm going to say scary things about security, I think. Um, and a lot of open source people believe that open sourcedness gives them an edge on security. And in a way, that's true, for sure. But the other thing about that all, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow thing, the eyes have to have good brains attached to them. And that turns out to be hard. So I think that I have such a good brain. Um, the other EFF people definitely do. And we have some cool volunteers, um, friends, maybe you, who are helping us with this stuff. And hopefully, you all have good brains. I think you do. So anyway. We're going to hack on some open source projects. I've picked, we're, we're hoping to, for the most part, stick with like software that people care about, like not nerdware. You know, like Linux kernel is very important, but only nerds will know if we found any bugs or not. 
But everyone uses Pigeon and Adium, right? The IM clients. Everyone uses Firefox. Everyone uses Chrome, whatever. So we're going to um, hack on those things. And so we started with Pigeon and LibPurple. And uh, we found a cool bug last Friday. And so what, the goal, our product here, is responsibly disclosed bugs, patches, and then like an overall, you know, like at the end of the year, sort of a, a presentation or paper on what all we found. And maybe there are some systemic problems in open source. Maybe there are some systemic solutions in open source. Like maybe we can say, we notice that open source projects tend not to have this kind of bug. But they do tend to have that kind of bug. Isn't that interesting? Dear open source developers, keep your eye on that kind of bug because it seems to be kind of common, or whatever it is. Obviously, Pigeon and LibPurple are in C. Obviously, C is a nightmare. So we have you know the classic C bugs, which are just, you have to root them out. You have to just get a big giant hammer and smash them all. And so that's what we're doing. Then there's all those things like XML is a problem. There's all sorts of uh, data format problems that are sort of um, would be general to a lot of things. Question? What about the sort of semi-open source projects like SourceForge? They did have some real security problems recently. Right, but uh, without a contract, I wouldn't want to bang on a website. Yeah, because yeah, I don't want to get in trouble. So like, it's totally cool for me to download some code and like read it myself, but it's not totally cool for me to try SQL injection against SourceForge. So I won't be, do I won't be doing that. Yeah, somebody else can get in trouble for doing that. But you know, if, Source, if SourceForge wants to sign a contract where they promise to pay us zero dollars and then not sue us, then yeah, maybe. And they'll give us like a, a development version of their site so that we're not banging on the real one. That would be cool. I've done that many times before for companies under contract. Sourcing their, uh, their site software. That's cool. Then, then we can look at it. Identica does that too, where you can... Um, download the code they use, and then, you know, test it yourself. So I have one minute left, so I'm going to have to skip something. Um, I'm going to say one more thing, since I have one minute. Um, if you want me to give you these slides, or I'll put them up online, or you can come bug me later. Um, and I'll, I'll be around all day, and you can ask me questions. So in my one last 30 seconds, I want to plug this project that I've started, barely, barely, barely started, but you can download what little code there is now. So if you, anyone heard of Tahoe, L-A-F-S? Oh, a couple hands. Okay, you're going to like it. It's very cool. It's a decentralized distributed internet file system that provides very cool security guarantees. However, I think that it has problems. It has performance problems. It's very hard for people to use. It's confusing. Because it has so many cool features, you have to understand all the cool features, and it's just plain confusing. It's not like Dropbox, where it's super easy. So I hope to make something a little more like Dropbox, and yet retain the security guarantees of Tahoe, because Tahoe is so cool. Um, I call my thing Octavia, after the awesome science fiction author Octavia Butler. Um, so you can get the code now. Again, if you Google for GitHub non-combatant Octavia, you'll get right to it. It doesn't work right now. I'm, I'm in the process of um, putting my ideas down in header and code form so that you can see them. Um, and I'm going to be slowly patching, patching, adding more features, making it go, making it do anything. I had a server in Java, and I had a client in Java, and I had a server in Python. But those are old, and I have a new design. And so what you have now is the beginnings of the new design. So please take a look at it. Um, laugh at me, find bugs, send patches. It would be cool. So we hope to have, it would be so good to have an internet file system that is secure, uh, reliable, fast. And so this is a movement towards that, possibly. So it's going to be a busy year. And I see that I have zero times left, but I think I'll take that question. Yeah, I've just done, uh, I'm a member of the uh, list. So oh, cool. <laughs> Yeah, we've had to, so the question was, for those who couldn't hear and for the camera people, um, she is a member of our of EFF's cooperating attorneys list where they help out with EFF-related cases. And there's been this rash of threatening slash suing slash shaming people who bit torrent porn. 
And so it's sort of like a, what we call the troll business model, because really what they're trying to do is to scare you into giving them a thousand bucks so that you don't have to go to court. Um, there's you know some intellectual property claims they might make, but they don't. They're not even really interested in actually suing you and winning. They're interested in scaring you into giving them some money. So what they do is they find your IP address and then they try to get the ISP to tell you to tell them your name based on your IP address and so on. And so she asks, have we done anything ab about that in that space? And actually, we've had a cool result. My colleague Seth Schoen likes to take those lists of IPs because what they do is they say, you know. Troll company versus 10,000 John Doe's, which means we don't know their names yet, but as soon as we do, we're suing them. And so then they, they try to get the court to let them find out the names of the John Doe's. So then what we do is we get the list of IPs that they found, and we find, oh, well, of these 10,000, only five are in the jurisdiction that they filed the proceedings in. Right. What tools do they use to get the IP addresses? They and are they accurate? The answer is no. And whatever tools they're using are pretty bad, because we we keep finding that like they have basically these lists of IPs that are almost junk. So I don't know if they're like running false BitTorrent peers, or if they're um, you know seeding file sharing networks with fake files that try to learn your IP address when you read them. I don't even really know. But whatever it is, it's it's proving to be kind of shaky. Um, they're going for a low cost. Sure. If I wanted to challenge it on a technical, uh, from a technical perspective, how could you unprove whatever, what's, the, you know, it's not the exactly address is not to be, because the Comcast of the world, they just, they just give you the information. They're not defending whether that IP address is yours or not. Right. So they know it is your, your IP address. So how do you technically unprove this link between IPs and people. So, is that is that a good characterization? Right. So there's a couple of ways, and that's one of the things that um, that like our guy Seth that he focuses on knowing those technical ways. One thing you can do is you can say, because like the the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority gives out ranges of IP addresses to ISPs, and like this block is for Chicago for Comcast. This block is for Comcast in San Francisco. And then you can look this up in a public database and say, oh, well, you're suing someone in Chicago, but they're, the IP address you claim they live at is really one of the San Francisco Comcasts or whatever. Or then you can also say, well, Comcast doles out these IP addresses randomly, and then you get a new lease on the IP address every hour. So whoever that was, there's no guarantee that it was them six weeks later, you know. So it, then it depends on very much on what exactly Comcast does. And then you have to like talk to Comcast engineers and say, well, how do you figure your DHCP routers or whatever, or um, lease giving system? And maybe it's different for Comcast than it is for, you know, AT&T or for some other, for Sonic in San Francisco. So sometimes it comes down case by case. Sometimes it comes down to querying public databases and just doing like basic fact smelling. Um, but it's there's some tricks to it, and you should talk to me more about it afterward. So I think I'm done, done, done. Clapping, clapping. Yes. Thank you for hanging on.